Prayer is God's idea. If he had not wanted to hear from you, he would have not invited you to pray. God wants to hear from you because he loves you. He cares about every detail of your life. There's nothing actually too big or too small for God's attention. Prayer is God's <clears throat> idea. Today I want us to take a little bit and talk about four purposes of prayer. In John the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th chapter, we have the last discussion that Jesus shared with his 12 disciples before he was crucified on the cross. He was constantly telling his disciples, I am going to die. I am going to be crucified, but I am going to be bodily resurrected, and I'm going to go back to heaven. I'm not going to be here physically anymore, but I'm going to be here spiritually. I am going to put my Holy Spirit into your lives, and you can talk to me, even though I am not here physically. You can talk to me through prayer. And he gives us four reasons for prayer. Number one, prayer is an act of dedication. Prayer is an opportunity to express our devotion to God and also our dependence upon God. It is an act of dedication where we're saying, God, I need you. Probably one of our biggest problems in praying is so often we don't feel that we need to depend on God because I can do it myself. I can handle this. I can do this. And ever since Adam and Eve, mankind has overly estimated his ability. So we think, I don't need the prayer because this is just something I do. I think a lot of times the biggest problem in prayer is admitting that we need God's help. The reason why a lot of people do not pray is because it cost. It cost honesty. God, I need you in this situation. I am inadequate. I am helpless. Prayer is a declaration of dependence on God. It's one of our ways saying, God, this proves that I'm depending on you. In John, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 5, Jesus gives an illustration about a plant. He said, I'm like the vine or the stalk of the plant, and you Christians are like the branches. If a man remains in me, and I remain in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone doesn't remain in me, he is like a branch that throws is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me, if you express your trust in me, if you express your dependence on me, and my word remains in you, you can ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. 
Folks, that's like a blank check. He says, if you're really dependent on me, you can ask whatever you will and I will give it to you. That's a, almost an unbelievable promise in prayer. The branch is connected to the vine or the stem, but if you cut the branch off, it loses its strength. It loses its power. If you cut a Christian off from God, he starts withering. I'm going to sort of age myself here. I can remember as a kid, I used to love to watch these movies where they had these deep sea divers. This is before some of you's time. They had these crazy suits on and they had these big old helmets that they had to <coughs> tighten down and he had a mask that he could look through. And they would let a guy over the ship and he would go down to uh, some sunken ship to find some treasure. Folks, the only link between the diver who was below the water and those who were in the boat was the air hose. The air hose was the lifeline. It was the support system. It was the connection between those above the water and those below. Likewise, prayer is our support system. You cut it off and you run out of spiritual air. Prayer is an act of dedication. It shows our dependence on God. Until we realize we need God, we can't really pray. Number two, prayer is an act of communications. Folks, most of our problems in life are communication problems. Communication with your wife or your husband or your business. Most of your problems in life come about from poor communications. For example, in a marriage, you cannot understand the other person unless you communicate with them. And you can't understand God. God's will and purpose for your life unless you communicate with Him. Some of you are old enough to remember back some years ago there was an international incident called the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember as a standoff between President Kennedy and the Premier Khrushchev of the Soviet Union. They were going to put missiles into Cuba. We almost went to war over it. But communications were established. In fact, one of the positive benefits of the Cuban Missile Crisis is they established a communication link called a hotline. Once again, this is before all of our phones and computers and all of these things. What they did is they put a red telephone on the desk of the President of the United States and they put a red telephone on the desk of the Premier of the Soviet Union. There was only one number and even if the telephone people went on strike, they could still get through. The purpose was so there would be no misunderstanding. If at any time somebody thought somebody else was doing something wrong, they simply could pick up the phone and communicate. Communications is vital everywhere in our international scene. And folks, it's vital in our Christian life. Prayer is an act of dedication and it is an act of communication. But you can't communicate with somebody unless you know your relationship to them. What is our relationship to God? In John the 15th chapter, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants because the servant doesn't know his master's business. 
Instead, I have called you friends for everything I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. He says the reason that you can ask anything in prayer is because we are friends. Think about it a moment, folks. The creator of the universe, the great I am, says, I don't treat you like servants. I don't treat you like slaves. I treat you like a friend. I think sometimes we have a hard time praying because we fail to recognize what an actual privilege it is to talk to God. <clears throat> if I was able to tell you that tomorrow at 10 a.m. arrangements had been made where you would have a 20-minute interview with the President of the United States it would be a one-on-one -on -one interview. You could sit down and talk to him about anything on your heart. What would you do? Probably, at least go get my hair fixed. <laughs> um, I'm sure you'd write down some questions. Because you're talking to the leader of the free world. Folks, we have a greater invitation than that. In this passage, we're invited to talk with the creator of the universe. I call that going to the top. God says, I am the king of kings and I am the Lord of lords and you are my friend and I want to talk to you. That's what prayer is. It is dedication, but it's also our communication. I think one of our problems is we really have a hard time believing that God is really interested in us as an individual. We seem to have problem conceiving that the creator of the universe is interested in car payments and mortgage pay payments. That he's interested in that person at work or a neighbor that really irritates you. Or the fact that you have back problems. Or whatever. When we fully understand and accept how much God loves us. Prayer will no longer be a problem. See the problem is not I have to pray. The problem is you don't realize how much God loves you and how much he cares about you. Why? Because we love to talk to people who love us the most. If you find prayer more as a duty or a ritual or routine that you really don't look forward to, it means you do not understand how much God is in love with you and how much he is interested in everything you're interested in. Of course, if you got to talk to God about something you're not interested in, who wants to do that? Nobody. But God says, I'm interested in you. We're friends. Prayer is an act of dedication. It is a way we express our dependence on God. Prayer is an act of communication. It's the way we communicate with God. In fact, it is our lifeline communication. It's the umbilical cord of the Christian life from which we draw strength. Number three, prayer is an act of supplication. The word supplication means request. 
In Philippians, the fourth chapter, it says, "Be do not be anxious about anything. Or, in other words, don't worry about anything. I always said that's one of the hardest verses in the Bible to obey. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The result of your asking, the result of your request in prayer will be peace of mind. Prayer is an act of supplication. It's the way we make our request. Jesus is talking in John the 16th chapter and he said, I tell you the truth. The Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. And ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. God says you're going to be happy because you get what you're asking for. I'm going to answer it. And your joy will be complete. Folks, the fact of the matter is prayer is God's chosen method of meeting your needs. The Bible teaches that there's some things God has promised to do only if we pray. So many people think, well, you know, God knows what I need. I don't have to ask Him. He'll just give it when I need it. Folks, that's not true. God has set it up in his plan that there are some things he will only do if we ask. If we pray. We read in the New Testament and we read about the New Testament Christians and they were unbelievable. They were happy. They were joyful. They were contagious and enthusiastic about life. They had power in their lives. They saw miracles happening on a regular basis. And we ask, how come I don't have that kind of prayer? Why don't we have the same kind of prayer they had in the New Testament? We don't ask. You have not because you ask not. James 4.2 says you don't have what you want. Because you don't ask God for it. Over 20 times in the New Testament. The Bible says for us to ask. Ask, seek, knock and keep on asking. God died one time and he went to heaven. Jesus is walking around with him. Showing him heaven and all of a sudden he sees all of these storehouses. All of these giant warehouses everywhere. And he says, Jesus, what's that? So Jesus takes him in one. And here are rows and rows and rows of all kind of fantastic things. Spiritual situations, homes, jobs, happy families. All kind of neat gifts. And the guy said, Lord, what are all these gifts? Jesus said, there's a tag on every one of these gifts. And they all said the same thing. The guy goes over and he looks at one. He looks at a second one. He looks at a third one. Each one said, never ask for Never ask for. C.H. Spurgeon, a great pastor in London, England, once said, God never shuts his storehouse until we shut our mouths. You have to ask. Prayer is an act of supplication. What are you lacking in your life right now simply because you have not asked God for it? You've tried every other thing, but you have stopped short of asking God. What do you ask for? You ask 
for what you want. Folks, God is not interested in you asking for something you don't want. Ask for what you want. Psalm 145 says he will feel, fulfill the desires of those who reverence him. Notice it does not just say needs. He will fulfill the desires. Why? Because if you're reverencing God, your desires are going to be right. Psalm 37 says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Once again, desires, not needs. If you're delighting yourself in God, if you're trying the best you know how to allow the Holy Spirit to live in you and guide you, your desires are not going to be wrong. Psalm 84 says, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Folks, God is not up in heaven hanging on the thing saying, you got to convince me you want this. He said, ask. Ask. Prayer is an act of dedication. It is an act of communication. And it is an act of supplication. Now, why does God want us to ask that your joy may be complete? It will make you happy. Folks, as a father, I'm sure you as parents, I love to grant requests for my children. <laughs> Even when I knew they didn't need it, I love to give it to them. God says, ask that your joy may be full. See, when you ask, everybody gets blessed. First of all, God gets blessed because he shows his nature as a giver. You get blessed because you get the answer to your request. And the world gets blessed because all of a sudden you got a testimony. Have you ever noticed one thing about people that have answered prayers? They can't keep quiet about it. They're going to share it. They're going to share it with everybody. And that's what God wants us to do. Jesus said, which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? If as an imperfect parent, I knew how to answer my kids request and give them good gifts. How much more is a perfect God with perfect love going to give gifts? God delights in answering requests. Prayer is an act of dedication, communication, supplication, and prayer is also an act of cooperation. I think this is the most exciting thing about prayer. It's an act of cooperation. See, God has sovereignly chosen in his plan that we can cooperate in his plan by praying and helping see his word done here on earth. See, prayer is God's program. Prayer is God's modus operandi. Prayer is God saying, I have chosen to limit myself to what I accomplish on earth simply by limiting myself to the faith of my children on earth. What they believe me for, what they ask me for, I will do. Folks, when we pray for other people, we're cooperating with God. We're teaming up with God to accomplish God's work in the world. Probably one of the most amazing verses in the Bible is in John the 14th chapter. Beginning with verse 11, it says, believe me, Jesus is talking. He says, believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. 
Have you been doing what Jesus has been doing? Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing, and he will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Folks, that's a verse that's almost impossible to believe until you read the next verse. And he said, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may bring glory to the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. How is it possible to do greater miracles than Jesus? Through prayer. By prayer. When we pray, it can do greater things than Jesus did while he was on earth. Now you're going to say, now wait a minute, how is that possible? Folks, prayer is not limited by time <laughs> nor space. It is limitless in scope. When Jesus was here on earth, he voluntarily limited himself in becoming a human being. By becoming a human, he said, I can only be in one place at one time. I can't be in the past, in the present, and the future at the same time. I can only be at this time in this place. And he limited his miracles to within the vicinity of where he was. But folks, prayer is not limited. Prayers are not limited by time. The prayers of Jesus that he prayed 2,000 years ago are still being answered today. The prayers that I pray today or you pray today can be answered three weeks or three months or three years from now. They're not limited by time. They're not limited by space. You can pray and it's like sending a missile. I could pray for somebody in Washington, D.C., and it's like sending a missile directly to their heart. And I never leave Bartow. Prayer is limitless in power. People may reject your appeals. They may re reject your arguments. They can even reject you as a person. But folks, they're defenseless against your prayers. They go straight to the heart. They have no defense system. The Bible reminds us in Proverbs 21 that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And he directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. Six times in this passage, Jesus said, if you will ask, I will answer. If you will ask, I will do. He says, your part is asking, my part is doing. You know, that's a lot better because he can do a lot more than you and I can do. Our part in cooperating with God's plan in the world is prayer. We can pray. Folks, the most important thing you can do in your Christian life is pray. Who do you think are going to be the heroes in heaven? The Billy Grahams? The David Jeremiah's? The Rick Warren's? The David Wilkerson's? The Chuck Swindoll's? The great Christian leaders? Folks, I really think that in heaven it's the unknown people who are praying for these men in their ministry. The people who are praying are the superstars of Christianity. God has blessed these men's ministry because people were praying for it. Prayer is the most important thing that you can do. Dwight L. Moody, a great pastor, once said, every great movement of God can be traced to a single praying, kneeling figure. Today, I've sort of given you an introduction on why we pray. In the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how to pray specifically and get answers. How do you pray for other people? How do you pray for impossible situations? 
Folks, I want our church to be a praying church. Because a praying church is a holy church. It is a committed church. When you pray, it makes you sensitive to God and to other people. A praying church is an enthusiastic church. Churches that pray see, see miracles. And that gets people excited. We need some miracles in our church. Some of you need some personal miracles. Maybe a miracle in your marriage or your health or in your finances or whatever. A growing, praying church is a church that sees God act. God acts according to prayer. A praying church is a happy church. When you pray and you get answers, your joy is full. There's nothing more fun than getting answers to your prayer. You get excited. It's contagious. People get involved. What are you lacking in your life right now? Simply because you have not asked God for it. He says ask. We're going to do a project over the next couple of weeks of an experiment. Right now I would like all of you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to think of one specific thing that you can pray for. What is uppermost in your mind right now? What is your greatest need? What is it that you would like to ask God for. Sit still a moment. Let God talk to you. Let something pop into your mind. Some of you are going to get answers to your prayers in the next couple of weeks. And we're going to believe God together to answer your prayers. With your head still bowed, I want to ask you in your mind, you don't have to do it out loud, I want you to pray a couple of things. Pray for the request that you just asked for. That you just thought of. Pray for next Sunday's service. Pray about bringing somebody to next Sunday's service. We're going to talk about how do you pray and get answers. I want to encourage you to pray every day this week for your request and for next Sunday services. I want you to pray in your hearts right now. Dear God, teach me how to pray. Jesus Christ, thank you for calling me your friend. I want to have a friendship relationship with you. Help me to understand what that means. I want you to direct my life. Father, I want to see miracles happen in my life. Things that can't be explained by my own effort. I want to see impossible situations made possible through prayer. Right now, Father, I ask you for, make your request to God. Father, help me to believe that you will answer it. Would you pray for our church? Pray that we will grow. Pray that we will develop spiritually. Father, I'm excited about what you're going to be able to do in our lives in the next few weeks. I'm excited, Father, that many people are going to have answers to their prayers as we learn what it really means to pray. Thank you again, Lord, that you call us friends. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.